before we begin today's rounds, I'd like to acknowledge that McMaster is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee Nations. It's within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, which is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. And I think when we offer a land acknowledgement, it's important to be reflective and mindful of our actions that go beyond just offering these words. And as a settler here on Turtle Island, I commit to actively reflecting and fulfilling my treaty responsibilities. And I offer this in the spirit of reconciliation. I'm really pleased to welcome our first speaker of 2024, Lauren Columbus. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Lauren uh, and the title of her talk, and then I will hand it over so we have lots of time for the presentation and some questions. Uh, Lauren is the academic practice lead at the Department of Midwifery. Uh, at London Health Sciences. She's a registered midwife with the TIME program, uh, which is an expanded midwifery care model, uh, also out of London Health Sciences Center. She's an adjunct clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, as well as McMaster University. She is currently moments away from finishing her master's in health profession education at Maastricht University. Her areas of research and academic interest include quality assurance and quality improvement, simulation, team dynamics on the birthing unit, and psychological safety and in interprofessional teams. Uh, I believe the talk, we will your slide will clarify us for in a moment, but uh, the talk is entitled Findings from a Multi-Year Research Program on Interprofessional Birthing Unit Teams, Speaking Up Self-Serving Bias and Self-Concept. And these are some of the results from Lauren's master's. So we're really excited to hear some of these. Uh, we are in just regular uh, Zoom mode, so we'll be kind of watching the chat and things like that. So if you do have questions or comments, you can put them in there. And when Lauren uh, is finished her presentation, we should have time for questions. And we would welcome either you can pop on your video and your mic at that time or put things in the chat. So thank you so much, uh, Lauren. You can share your slides and uh, thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth, and to everyone at the MMRC for providing me with this opportunity to share our research with um, everyone today. Um, I'll be sharing a summary of a research program that I've been fortunate to be a part of over the past several years at LHSC since uh, I've joined the organization about just over three years ago. And I have presented parts uh, of these studies or, or each of these studies at a variety of different conferences and and talk. So some of you may be familiar with, with some of it, and I apologize for any repetition, but uh, this was a bit of a unique opportunity to present all three of the studies together um, in sort of a, a bit of a research program um, and just how the findings of one built off the other. And I think uh, I, I'm really excited to have the chance to show how uh, we developed this program together with the uh, local study team that I have here uh, at Western. And so uh, also just to say, I don't want this to be super formal and that if you have a question or anything, I know uh, we're gonna leave about 15 minutes at the end for discussion and questions. Um, and I have some questions too that I might throw out to the audience just to help us sort of uh, maybe pick your brains about some future uh, research ideas that we have. But in the meantime, yeah, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand or whatever. And I'm also working from two screens because of a little tech issue. So I apologize if uh, things don't go perfectly smoothly with the slides here. Um, okay, let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. Okay, I would be uh, remiss, I guess, uh, in a session about teamwork if I did not shout out this great group of people that I've been working with on all of the research here uh, in London. And I think the strength of our team is in our diversity and in everyone's different backgrounds um, and their, their training and their strengths. And I feel like we have a great group of people that we're working at largely out of Siri, which is our Center for Education and Research Innovation at Schulich. Um, and so I, um, I've been working with uh, Ima, who is a medical student here at Schulich, Rachel Pack, who is a sociologist based out of Siri. Uh, her her uh, background in sociology and her expertise in a lot of sort of social and psych theories has been really beneficial and working with her uh, has really been a huge, huge, huge learning opportunity for me that I'm very grateful for. Uh, we've also been working with Harrison, who's one of our MFMs here and brings a really interesting sort of high risk lens to a lot of our work. And obviously Taryn, who has been um, you know, instrumental in, in so much of this work. She is um, an obstetrician gynecologist here as well. 
but she's also a simulation fellow. Um, well, she has her simulation fellowship and um, her PhD as well, and is an expert in qualitative methodologies. So, so I kind of latched on to Taryn uh, and this particular first study I'm going to be talking about when I arrived in London. And then I kind of made her be my master's preceptor. And I, I don't think she's, you know, ever going to really be able to get rid of us now that we've kind of latched on to her. But um, I would just say that for anyone who is here or um, thinking about, uh, you know, doing a master's or doing incorporating research into their career as a midwife, I would say that my career feels so much richer having, you know, met these people and worked with this team um, and getting to learn from them. And so I, I can't say enough about what a great experience it's been to have this really awesome research team. So that's the background of how uh, I met the team and how our work sort of uh, started. But I just provide a background. I thought I'd provide a background on the ideas and the types of questions that we were hoping to ask and answer um, as as part of this research program. I think anyone who's worked on a birthing unit at any point in their careers would probably note that they can be rife with challenging interprofessional interactions, especially because of the fluid nature of how birthing unit teams uh, come together. I think some of us may have even noted that some of our poor outcomes potentially uh, could have been preventable if only our teams had been functioning differently. And some of us, which included Taryn, myself, Harrison, have also noted that in cases where we've had preventable poor outcomes that have happened, um, most healthcare teams are not using these outcomes as a chance for authentic quality improvement. And most of our personal experiences with QA and QI endeavors have left so much to be desired, and they've heavily focused on the systems aspects rather than on the actual sort of interpersonal errors um, and personal errors that can happen as part of the work that we do. And I think it's the ad hoc nature of most interprofessional healthcare teams that creates really significant barriers um, to facilitating adaptability and team learning. And these are really critical aspects of team success. So we have things like silence within our healthcare teams. We have reluctance to voice uncertainty. We have unwillingness to engage in, in humble self-reflection. And these are some really thorny challenges that we know impede team learning. So Taryn, who has her, her simulation fellowship, had thought of this idea of using simulation primed inquiry as a novel methodologic approach to facilitating this in-depth exploration of these types of team dynamics. So that was the jumping off point for this sort of program of research and our first study. So her um, her first study that that Taryn um, designed, which was the maybe I'm not that approachable, uh, it she designed a series of simulations with a partial confederate um, that included scripted errors as well as deception in the simulations to see how birthing team members responded to errors. So even though those simulations did not actually involve any fetal health surveillance cases, we noted during the interviews for that study that when we were discussing error. Lo and behold, everybody wanted to talk about fetal health surveillance and oxytocin use. And obviously, insurance claim data uh, would support that those are two of the biggest areas in obstetrics for error and communication breakdown. So that's what spurred our second study, um, which became um, my thesis and, and part of my master's, uh, that looked at FHS refresher courses and case-based scenarios as a, also using that as a priming intervention for a constructivist grounded theory study. So we looked at FHS interpretation and response in a team setting. Lastly, for our third study here, we had an unexpected finding in the data from that study, which led to our third paper, which is about midwives self-concept. And that focused mostly on the impact that interprofessional interactions have on midwives. So it's a little bit more midwifery focused. Um, and we ended up theoretically sampling more midwives as part of that final data collection piece. And that uh, comprised the final study. So without further ado, we'll jump into uh, our first uh, study here on, with simulation. Um, this, as I mentioned, involves scripted errors in, uh, embedded into the sim. And Taryn was inspired to do this based on a combination of findings from the simulation research landscape, as well as some of uh, Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety and what she calls the epidemic of silence. So this, this phenomenon, which I'm sure um, all of us who have worked in healthcare teams have noted, is that people will hold back even when they believe um, that what they have to say could actually be important for the organization, the patient, or even for themselves. 
and we know that. Um, and yet all the existing simulation research um, literature that's attempted to sort of solve the problem of, you know, why don't people speak up when they're worried or when they're concerned or when they think that an error might be made? It's because it focuses sort of exclusively on what we call subordinate team members or people who maybe have low authority or occupy low positions on the hierarchy. It frames speaking up as this moral imperative where they sort of trust that, oh, good people will speak up um, when it's important to do so, even though there's lots of literature that says that this is not in fact true. Um, that interpersonal risk taking of speaking up in the setting of, of an error or, an, or a healthcare team uh, is too high for most people to make. It also focuses on teaching these low authority team members to use sort of a script that they would then use to say, you know, I'm really worried about this. And then if that's ignored, then they're expected to sort of keep pushing it and that they would trust that eventually the team leader would sort of listen to that. And also, um, as most of us who have worked in teams know, this is also not a very accurate um, just description of how team dynamics play out. So um, what Taryn was interested in looking at is sort of the role and the influence of that team leader and kind of flipping the simulation research on its head and saying, well, rather than always asking these subordinate team members to take, you know, to speak up at great interpersonal risk, how can we explore whether it's actually sort of on the faculty to, to make themselves um, to, to behave in a way that they actually um, are encouraging speaking up from their other team members. So that informed the research question, which was to look at how physicians responded when they were challenged. Do they recognize when they're being challenged? And do they understand what their role is in establishing psychological safety on healthcare teams? Um, I mentioned that her um, methods that she designed came from um, this idea of using a simulation primed qualitative inquiry. And I'm just going to mention the paper where she found this idea, which is by Wong et al., um, who used it in a sort of pediatric setting. But what they propose in that study is that um, when you're doing qualitative research, and as many of you may know, uh, if you're doing a focus group or semi-structured interviews, when you sit somebody down and say to them, okay, so can you think of a time when, or tell me about, you know, this type of error or when you challenge something. It can be really hard for people to think of, like to recall instances where that happened. And it can also be challenging for them to be honest with somebody, you know, that they don't know in a setting where they're expected to talk about error or some fairly vulnerable or sensitive topics. So that can be a limitation on qualitative research and um, simulation prime qualitative inquiry was a solution to that where you can design a simulation, you have people participate in it, and it almost um, elicits those feelings from people that you can then explore in your, uh, in your interviews. And so that's, um, that was sort of the basis for this inquiry. Um, and it's a really, really brilliant design where she we ran 13 interprofessional simulations and ultimately we debriefed all of them afterwards and did some follow-up interviews. We included these challenge moments in the simulations where we had an OB who was a partial confederate who actually made a mistake. So they were scripted to make that mistake, but to otherwise just sort of behave like they would on a bad day. Um, and that was really... Uh, what we were watching for to see how people actually challenged um, if they noticed the error. Obviously, um, in terms of sort of the results, there were extremely few overt direct challenges uh, to errors that were made by what we considered to be the team leader. Um, and so instead, there was sort of a number of different types of behaviors from the participants that questioned or, or brought up subtle challenges as opposed to direct overt challenges like the simulation literature has typically asked um, us to teach. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so um, this brings us to the concept of approachability. And this was our major finding from this study. Uh, one of the quotations, which is uh, where we got the title from, was from an obstetrician who reflected that maybe they weren't that approachable. Maybe they're scared to disagree with me. I don't think that's the case at this resident's training level, but I don't know, maybe I should reflect on it myself. We had a resident who further added that the sim was important because uh, for the consultants to see because I think they expect us to just feel comfortable speaking up about these things, and that's not the case. Most of the faculty participants actually thought of themselves as approachable prior to going into the simulation, but then their sim, whoops, sorry about that. 
their experiences in the simulation actually challenged that sense of approachability and what it meant to be approachable. So it prompted the faculty in the uh, interviews to sort of confront the possibility that just because they weren't overtly problematic people, they weren't being um, overly rude uh, or dismissive to the residents in the simulations, it still meant that it wasn't enough to create a sufficient condition for speaking up to occur. This was uh, our sort of proposed model that came out of that, uh, of the reflections and the um, debrief, as well as the interviews. And we identified these three building blocks of what we considered to be approachability. So that was your availability, which you signaled through your presence on the unit. Um, it was modeling vulnerability through debriefing, as well as um, expressing uncertainty and thinking aloud. So those were sort of the practical ways that the faculty could signal to their other team members that they were perhaps somebody that could be approachable in the case of an error or a question. What this sort of told us is that approachability is actually more than just being kind or decent or not rude or the absence of being rude. And instead, it really demonstrated that team leaders have to actually actively build themselves as approachable people. This is typically not a skill that's taught. Um, and something that I think we probably know from most of our interactions that very few people and very few teammates actually have, um, but could be something that should be probably introduced in, um, in simulation in different education settings where we could teach how people can signal themselves as approachable. It also um, illustrates that team leaders are actually a really key part of the solution and that it's not just always subordinate team members who should be taught to speak up. And it did show the impact that debriefing can have in repairing situations where perhaps you weren't your best self or it was a very stressful situation that sort of engendered some behavior that may not have been um, ideal. Uh, it also seems really simple, but in practice, it's actually very hard to do. Um, and so, uh, like I said, this this sort of place that this we felt that this could go would be um, that it could support the use and the utility of simulation in um, in teaching these skills and um, and building team leaders that are more approachable. This is also very relevant to the midwifery situation as well, because though we had um, obstetricians as our team leaders. Um, midwives can be team leaders in, in their own settings as well. So for instance, with others, with students, with other midwives who may be less experienced from them. And so we think the findings, though they focused on sort of traditional birthing unit teams, could actually apply to other um, team settings as well. This uh, brings us to our next study um, and dive. we're gonna dive in a little bit into FHS um, and communication issues within birthing teams. And as I mentioned, we had found um, some uh, very significant focus placed in our first study on people wanting to talk about instances where they, they had a disagreement regarding fetal health surveillance interpretation or oxytocin use and how that led to what they perceived to be an error that they didn't feel comfortable speaking up against. And so, uh, as I mentioned, neither of our SIMs featured any fetal health surveillance, but it was something that people kept coming back to over and over again. And I think the reasons for that are probably pretty obvious. Um, I probably don't need to repeat any of this, but we know that so much of our litigation fees um, from HEROC and from the CMPA go towards obstetrical cases. And that in about two thirds of those cases, they identify preventable outcome or preventable factors in those poor outcomes. So obviously we're not looking at cases of, you know, 22 week PPROMs uh, with twins where things don't go so well we're looking at preventable um, situations, which are you know, very present in, in a good majority of these cases. For anyone who's been you know, looking at the HEROC and AOM uh, risk assessment checklists, uh, on that list as well, we have mismanagement of intrapartum uh, fetal monitoring as well. So it's a factor that affects anybody who works on birthing units. That is largely what informed our research question. So just looking at how interprofessional dynamics shape decision-making regarding FHS, classification, interpretation, and response. And we felt like if we could better understand um, how, how people interacted around those decisions, then we could potentially improve the training programs that we offer, as well as sort of redefine um, our team behaviors. 
And I won't get too much into the, you know, the, the details around heuristics, but in order to look at this problem, we really had to pull some theories from psychology uh, as part of our conceptual framework. And specifically, we ended up looking at the self-serving bias theory. So there are different types of biases and we'll specifically be focusing on cognitive biases. And I remind everyone at this point that not all biases are bad. And in fact, they're often the basis for very accurate heuristics that we use all the time in our day-to-day -day life. And they help us process uh, like a bombardment of information very quickly. So we use heuristics over and over and over again throughout the day. Um, and that's very important to help our brains process that information. But what we do know about heuristics is that they can be inaccurate and they can lead to errors in thinking. And that's what we're sort of going to focus on with this study. The, the mental shortcuts um, or these heuristics that we use, they do actually help us make decisions really quickly. And especially we rely on them when we're in situations of uncertainty and also situations where we're making very high stakes decisions. And so we realize that when we're working in birthing unit teams, where we have a bombardment of information from fetal health surveillance, from everything going on clinically in the room, um, we tend to rely on heuristics even more so than we would in other clinical contexts. So that's why they factor into a study. Some of the biases um, that use heuristics are self-enhancement biases, self-serving attribution biases, and something called the ultimate attribution error. So these refer, um, self-serving attribution biases refer to this well-established social psychology theory that people will take more credit than is perhaps due uh, for their successes, but they tend to deny responsibility for their failures. And trust me, the first time that I read about all this, I immediately was like, no, I don't do that. Um, surely, I, surely I'm surely i very open to uh, taking responsibility for my failures. But it turns out that this is something that all humans do. We all do it. Um, so rather than sort of initially feeling shame or, you know, um, sort of denying it, uh, it's actually been really, really interesting to kind of lean into it and see the response that people have to just acknowledging that this is how they're going to behave in a team setting and, and going from there. Um, in terms of the ultimate attribution error, this is a um, concept that sort of means that we tend to blame our outgroup members for failures, but we credit our in-group members for success. So this relies on sort of a biased memory that we hold in doing so. So, you know, our tendency to blame nurses or to blame OBs for bad outcomes, but rarely blaming midwives um, and vice versa. So I just want to reemphasize, though, that the, in order to function as a human being um, on the birthing unit where we're making these life and death decisions sometimes or very high stakes decisions, we actually really, really need this sort of healthy dose of self-esteem and a very, very healthy dose of ego. And the reason that humans have developed these types of biases are actually to protect our self-esteem and our ego. So they're not bad um, necessarily. They are serve a very important sort of psychological function in keeping our egos intact so that we can live and function in the world. Um, but they're not necessarily accurate. And so I think rather than to say, um, you know, how do we get rid of them? They're really not going anywhere. They're very important, but it's more about recognizing that they lead to errors in thinking and, and what happens when we're using them in team settings. So um, our results from this study um, and one of what we felt to be the most striking finding was that all five um, different professions that we interviewed as part of this research um, we're very good at pointing out when other people, particularly colleagues from other professions, um, exhibited problematic clinical or interpersonal behaviors, but they rarely acknowledged ins instances where they themselves were the problem. So aside from a few outliers, um, if they, they did provide an example of a time where perhaps they overcalled a fetal health surveillance strip as abnormal, ended up in a C-section, and then the baby was completely fine, they tended to always be cases where the outcome was okay. So it was rarely a case where the outcome was in fact poor and could have been preventable. Um, so this um, kind of led us to create this, this idea that birthing team uh, members will create their own self-schematization where they're not part of the problem, the errors were not their fault, 
they have the right philosophy of care and their profession doesn't make the kind of same mistakes that another profession might. Whereas the way that they are schematized by their colleagues is that their colleagues do see them as part of the problem. They do see the errors as being mostly their fault. They definitely questioned each other's philosophies of care um, and tended to blame their profession sort of overall for some of the mistakes that were seen. Um, these types of self-serving attributional biases can really act as a barrier to quality improvement because it means that birthing unit members are biased towards not seeing their role or the role that they play in preventable poor outcomes, but rather they place this disproportionate amount of blame on their colleagues um, from other professions. So obviously, if we're all doing this um, simultaneously, then QI interventions like, you know, M&M rounds or FHS refresher courses or any sort of any of those teaching moments and, and QA, QI moments that we have um, as part of our ongoing continuing professional development may not be as effective as they could be um, if we felt like there was a way that we could address those biases and sort of move beyond them. I'm gonna give you a little example of a quote um, that we found from one of our interviews. And this was from a nurse who said, you know, I understand the fear of like that physician is so scary. I have to tell them that I don't like this strip, but then they just bark at me and tell me that it's fine. Sometimes it's hard to feel like you're brave enough to talk to these people. So I think the more interactions we have as a group, then they become more human and you're not so terrified of them. So our, our interviews were full of comments about instances like this where people could recall feeling very psychologically unsafe in bringing up a question or, a, or perceived error, much like in um, our initial simulation study. Um, but when we asked people when they, if they could recall a moment where they um, were perhaps uh, the one who had made an error or weren't, you know, maybe willing to acknowledge that they'd made an error, very, very, very few people were were able to provide an example of that. So obviously, if everyone is saying, yeah, I've experienced a case where um, I wasn't, you know, I, I saw an error made, I tried to bring it up, but I, you know, it didn't go very well. No one is willing to acknowledge that they might have been that person. Um, and so that was sort of this, this self-serving attributional bias that we saw. Um, some of the kind of results to come out of this are that obviously when we strategically process information, this can lead to fairly significant memory biases and that these memory biases can be an impact, uh, a barrier to accurate self-assessment. Uh, we know that ultimate attribution error errors are problematic for birthing unit teams um, when they can actually be comprised of anywhere from sort of four to six different individuals at any time. So it means that there's sort of four to six potential different um, conceptualizations of people's roles in the error that are that are sort of floating around the team at any given time. But what we do know from the literature on team competence is that teams, uh, the competence of a team is determined by the social interactions that the team members have with each other. And so if those social interactions are sort of limited by these biases, then that that could theoretically limit our team functionality and competence. A really interesting finding uh, regarding the divergent philosophies of care that I felt was probably of particular interest to midwives um, was uh, the disparate sort of cognitive maps that people hold um, in different professions and how uh, it's those divergent philosophies of care that actually cause you to have sort of more allegiance to members of your own profession than you were, would towards this larger sort of birthing unit team identity. Um, the cognitive maps that we hold, uh, they reflect how each discipline is educated, socialized, and they're actually these really important cultural components of each profession, um, but they, they impact what we see. And so it's, it's a little bit of a way to explain why different professions can look at the same fetal health surveillance tracing or the same clinical situation and see different things and come away with different plans. And that seems to be a, a huge point of contention. Um, and it certainly was when we held our um, interdisciplinary refresher courses where we had you know, chosen cases and we would embed some polls into the, um, the courses 
And we would say, okay, based on this strip, would you stop the oxytocin or would you keep going? And oftentimes the results were 50-50. And I think that's a really frustrating um, aspect to intrapartum care, particularly with respect to FHS interpretation and oxytocin use, is that depending on, on your cognitive map, you will look at these seemingly objective um, clinical um, uh, aspects of this person's care and come away with different opinions around how this care should be provided. I think what was a big takeaway for us from this study is that it's not necessarily that any of those takeaways are maybe incorrect, but more that uh, they will be different because of these cultural components about how you know we are educated and socialized and, and how we um, conceptualize our philosophy around birth which we, we know, obviously, those philosophies of care differ quite significantly between each profession. Um, the reason that that was a really critical finding in terms of the outcomes of this study was related to the idea of superordinate goal setting. So we know that a way to overcome team um, sort of in-group, out-group biases is uh, based on, a, a, again, a psychological study uh, that was done back in the 70s where um, Sheriff found that if two sort of different groups that would otherwise have been opposed could create sort of a superordinate goal, then they could actually overcome their in-group, out-group biases. And there's a lot of great literature out there um, about birthing unit teams or healthcare team competence that says, you know, you have to sort of get beyond um, your individual siloed identities to create this sort of superordinate goal and then you'll be able to overcome your in-group, out-group biases. However, in our study, people were not able to form superordinate goals uh, with each other because their philosophies of care and sort of their take on um, you know, what was most important to come out of that, uh, that birth uh, prevented them from doing so. And so even though we all think you know, it should be easy to form a superordinate goal in the birthing unit setting, which would just be to say, healthy, healthy birthing person, healthy baby, uh, it's actually um, much more complicated than that and, and wasn't something that most of our interview subjects felt that they could achieve. This also impacts the notion of sort of expanding our care professional social identities outside of our own professions and creating these sort of team-based identities. And I think that that's been proposed so often um, in the literature because it is a really good way of saying, well, if we stop identifying along the lines of professions and instead identify as sort of a larger patient care team, then that should get rid of those in-group, out-group um, biases held towards each other. Uh, however, it's the ability to sort of form that common team-based identity that I think can be quite challenging. Um, there's a great study from Scotland, I believe, by Karens um, et al. And they talk about how the people, um, and specifically in medicine as well, thrive on this idea of sort of therapeutic bashing of, of outgroups and othering groups, and that perhaps there's a part of our identity that needs these different silos and different groups in order to engage in that kind of um, outgroup derogation in order to sort of create your own in-group cohesion. So there's almost a weighing of well, is your in-group cohesion between your profession or within your profession more important than sort of your, your interprofessional cohesion? Uh, so that's a really fantastic study if anyone is ever interested in reading a little bit more about that. So just to kind of wrap up uh, this, this study here, some of our takeaways and some of the things we were thinking about in terms of the implications for practice and future research was that really normalizing talking about error is something that we hope might address some of those initial people level issues. And at least if some QI initiatives could train members to actually recognize their role in core outcomes, it might destigmatize talking about error a little bit um, and, and get people to recognize that everyone will make a mistake in their career. Everyone has made errors or maybe contributed to preventable outcomes in their career um, and that it's okay to talk about it. We also, uh, because of those biases and the fact that we may we hold on to the biases in order to increase our self-esteem, uh, 
we thought that other ways of increasing self-esteem could actually help reduce that reliance on self-enhancing biases. And um, self-esteem is a big thing um, that came out of this study and also will come out of the findings from the next study that I'm going to talk about. So um, that one is something that we'll see crop up again. Um, and just all thinking of alternate ways of forming superordinate goals. This will bring us then to uh, the final study that I'm going to talk about today, and that focused more on the impact that these interprofessional interactions actually have on midwives, and specifically on their self-concept, or um, in this case, professional self-concept, which I will call PSC. Um, I would mentioned that this had been an unexpected finding that was not part of our research question from our um, second study on FHS, uh, but it warranted additional theoretical sampling because it was so prevalent um, in the midwifery study population, but not from the other um, professions that we interviewed. So we felt like it sort of needed its own kind of theoretical sampling where we added um, a few more midwives and, and sort of started to develop our theory around midwives and PSC. Not long after that initial data analysis, Liz um, and her study team uh, had published this study on midwives mental health. And it was really nice to feel like we could enter into this scholarly conversation with some other work that had specifically looked at midwives experience, um, though we were not looking specifically at midwives mental health as their study was. But the findings from their study were very much related to our research question and are part of a bigger conversation that we felt like we could join that spoke to factors um, that impact the midwifery workforce, things like burnout, um, retention, and job satisfaction. Most of the literature that we'd come across on um, PSC was related to nursing. And so it was nice to have a little bit of the Ontario and sort of Canadian midwifery um, research to, to kind of, like I said, join that conversation. Um, obviously in the UK, there has been a lot of study as done over a number of years on um, midwifery retention and burnout, but most of them have focused on, um, I guess the, the outcomes that came out of Liz's study and our study actually didn't show up in that until quite far down the list in terms of reasons for burnout. So um, in, in this study here, uh, they mentioned that the perception that their profession was poorly understood by other health professionals was actually the most frequently reported factor that negatively impacted midwives' mental health. Um, they also talked about the delegitimization of the profession as having an impact on midwives' mental health and feeling like their work was not valued by their um, colleagues. These didn't even show up in sort of the top 10, 15, 20 reasons in a lot of the studies out of the UK. Um, for them, it was more like insufficient staffing, high workload and things like that. So that's just the difference between sort of a UK context and maybe the Ontario context. Um, so I was grateful to see this published um, and, and to be able to sort of look at um, how this related to the findings that we had in our study. Another um, study that also related to our findings on PSC was by Bridges um, et al. And it's done in Toronto, a really, really fantastic institutional ethnography study. Um, if anyone works on a birthing unit, this would be definitely of interest to you to read. So I'd recommend it. But they talked about this sort of perceived subordinacy that midwives have in the hospital powerarchy and having to constantly prove themselves. And this was also something that came out in our interviews as well um, for this study. Just before I launch into some of our results, uh, I wanted to define self-concept here. Um, so various scholars have contributed to the definition of self-concept over the years, but largely it just comes down to uh, our, our individual cognition and understanding of themselves as of ourselves as professionals. It affects our way of thinking, our role development, um, and our professional behavior and performance. It's multidimensional in that it's both cognitive as well as effective. Um, we actively take a role in shaping our self-concept through a variety of different motives um, that I'll talk about in a moment. And really it just comes down to what we think about when we think about ourselves as midwives. <laughs> 
And one of the reasons we think professional self-concept is really important is because the results from the nursing and physician literature on PSC has uh, shown some of the benefits of having a really robust, um, well-formed uh, PSC. It's that people are more accountable to their patients and results. They treat others with more respect, both patients and other healthcare providers. They're more empowered. They have medical, better clinical outcomes and problem-solving skills and they are less prone to burnout. So I would say that the hook for us for this study was if we could um, you know, sort of discern how we can protect or improve midwives PSC, then it could potentially be protective um, towards um, the midwifery workforce. I will just mention that um, in the nursing literature, uh, a couple of examples here from Gali Roshan and Farhadi, Farhadi, they really link self-concept to burnout. Um, and they talk about how uh, for nurses, um, having a really well-developed and robust PSC was very strongly linked to lower rates of burnout, as well as higher rates of job satisfaction and things like that. Um, but what they suggest in their studies is that um, organizations, hospitals, managers should really concern themselves with nursing self-concept because they could design ways within the hospital setting of sort of modifying the work environment for nurses so that they could create a, a higher, better self-concept that might buffer them against the sort of natural challenges that come from working in a really difficult healthcare setting. And we, we propose that probably the same thing could be true for midwives as well. So our research question um, focused on um, how interprofessional relationships uh, and interactions impact midwives PSC. And these are some of the ways, just quickly thrown up here on the screen, that we know that self-concept concept is impacted by um, different things that happen in our lives and at work. So you can see here that there's a variety of sort of social, cultural, structural aspects to our day-to-day -day work that might impact our PSC. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Next, um, one of the reasons that we felt like this was um, important and important to the midwifery research was that if we could get an idea of ways that we could specifically modify our interprofessional interactions, then perhaps this could help improve midwifery PSC. Just a few things to point out. I mentioned earlier that we have three um, different different motives that actually contribute to our self-concept. And so uh, Jika specifically um, suggested that these three, self-esteem, self-efficacy, and self-authenticity, are three that make up our self-concept. And so humans are sort of motivated by all three of these things. We're motivated to maintain a good self-esteem. We're motivated to be self-efficacious and we're motivated towards authenticity. And he suggested that as a result, our behaviors will sort of um, inform our PSC through these three motives. And interestingly, um, the interpersonal domain is related more to the self-esteem and it, it's the, the piece that impacts your self-esteem the most. So these are face-to-face -face interactions. And our social structural domain is most related to self-efficacy. And it's our cultural domain and our beliefs, values, and morals that are most um, related to self-authenticity. And so you can you can imagine through a variety of different interactions that we have on the unit that um, different pieces can come up to impact different aspects of our self-concept. So for example, for the interpersonal domain, it would be those interprofessional kind of face-to-face -face interactions that we have that might potentially go poorly um, and, and as a result, decrease people's self-esteem. Uh, similarly, for self-efficacy, when we talk about our social and structural domains, it looks at your position and the role that you occupy within your team and on your birthing unit. And we know that in cases of transfers of care or um, depending on sort of scope limitations placed in hospitals, that midwives can sometimes feel a very diminished role in terms of how they work on the unit or how they work with others. Or even they can feel that their colleagues perceive their role as being diminished, even if it actually isn't. And so this impacts their self-efficacy. Also from our the results from our uh, interviews, the cultural domain was a really interesting one because it it's related to our, our need to feel authentic and authentic to our beliefs, our values, and our morals. 
But what we found from our interviews and our interview results were that a lot of midwives felt that upholding their um, sort of values of informed choice, um, you know, choice of birthplace and, and different aspects of our philosophy of care, uh, when they upheld them, and if that simultaneously became sort of a burden to their colleagues on the floor, whether that meant it resulted in judgment from colleagues around, you know, why they made the, the clinical decisions that they did, um, or whether it resulted in actually sort of additional burden being placed on nursing resources or physician resources, this greatly impacted um, midwife's sense of self-authenticity. So I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I'm actually just going to sort of get through a couple of slides quickly here. But just to sort of show the framework for our results, we found that it was through competition, um, legitimacy, or a delegitimizing of the profession, and a role reduction um, that it was these sort of three areas and, and um, psychosocial domains that impacted overall midwives professional self-concept. This is our very early kind of preliminary working model of how we think this works, but largely the sort of large blue circle on the outside represented these psychosocial domains that manifest from our interprofessional interactions on the floor. And you can see how it's through these three aspects, competition, role reduction, and legitimacy of the profession that each of those motives end up being impacted um, and have sort of a diminishing effect on midwives professional self-concept. Um, the only thing I will add just before I start to wrap things up here, um, and I'm going to skip these quotes because we just don't have time to go through them, but this one was a divergent example and a divergent finding in our um, interviews. And it's a long quotation, so I'm not going to read it all, but essentially the midwife here had mentioned a case of a transfer of care where ultimately the, the OB ended up having to be in a C-section. And so the patient started to precipitously deliver, she got ready and, and ultimately conducted the delivery just as the OB was coming in the room. And the OB sort of thought, okay, well, you know, she's she's um, catching this baby, I may as well just make myself useful and hand her instruments and things like that. And they ended up having this really collegial um, interaction. And the midwife was able to reflect that it was this very positive experience that she felt meant there was a lot of respect accorded to her role and she accorded a lot of respect to the obstetrician's role and they felt like they created the best sort of safest care for this client. And this uh, we felt was a really powerful example of a way in which that interprofessional interaction actually helped increase or improve this midwife sense of PSC as opposed to diminish it, um, which was largely the examples that we found in, in the remaining interviews. And so this provided somewhat of an example for us around the importance of self-esteem and, and the role that it could play in protecting um, midwives PSC. We also had talked about self-esteem in um, our previous study as well and how it related to this reliance on somewhat negative uh, biases and self-enhancing biases. And so this common thread of self-esteem as being a fairly important part uh, behind our interprofessional interactions is something that we're hoping to uh, look at and, and talk about in uh, future studies. And so um, I'd love to hear from anyone here as I sort of wrap this presentation up now, uh, whether that's, um, yeah, if they had any thoughts on, on the role that self-esteem may have played in um, your own profession and, you know, maybe different ways of conceptualizing that. So I'm going to stop my presentation now and hand it over to Beth. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was amazing. There's so much going through my head right now, especially because you walked us through all three of those studies. And I recognize we probably didn't get to hear some of your thoughts about like how to modify midwives PSC, which I'm now very intrigued about. Yeah. Um, but I think we should have some questions so people can put them in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye out there. I see Kathy has a question too. So Kathy, feel free to just pop on your video, pop on your mic and jump in. Yeah, I'm not sure how I ended up <laughs> in the other group, but here I am. Uh, one of the things that um, I was wondering about um, whether Lauren had found anything if you found anything in the literature about how unit size affects um, 
some of this because um, um, I know that anecdotally, um, um, after the transfer happened, um, there was a lot of uh, really discomfort with the fact that nobody knew who anybody was. And midwives in particular tend to be, uh, I would say, a far more transient population than either uh, the nursing population or certainly the obstetrical population. And how the um, impact of the inability actually just to form the relationships be because often what I would hear from obstetricians was that was that I don't know that person, you know, and that translated into trust. And so um, I'm wondering whether in the sense of this, um, there was any um, um, any uh, comparison because I would actually, without knowing for sure, but hazard a guess right now that LHSC is largely the lar likely the largest unit in the province, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's massive. If for anybody, we it, it is, is just, yeah, it's massive. <laughs> yeah, hard to hard to until you see it to know, but it is it's huge. Yeah, I think that's a really great question, and it actually came up a lot in our interview in our interviews where people kept saying things like, you know, if I get to know someone better, maybe that would, maybe that would help. Um, obviously, because our study was a single, single site study, um, we don't really have a comparison to a smaller site. Although I will say just in terms of sort of other literature that's out there, I think we see the same types of issues on different birthing units of different sizes and in different places in Canada. Um, but it may come down less to not knowing that person, but ultimately just to still having um, those interpersonal sort of issues with communicating and connecting with other people on the team. So while I do think there's probably an advantage to knowing the people you work with, it doesn't change much if you are working with somebody that you know, you're very divergent on in terms of your philosophies of care, the way you communicate. Um, or your willingness to still sort of see them as an outgroup member and kind of resort to some of those, um, you know, biases that we know that we use towards outgroup members. So I think there's definitely a place for like contact theory and just, you know, the more you know someone, the harder it is to sort of treat them poorly. Um, but I don't know that that's necessarily been shown to sort of solve all of the issues. But yes, recreating these types of studies in smaller settings or more diverse settings would be really interesting. It is one of the unique challenges of the birthing unit, right, is that the team is constantly changing. It's never the same team kind of replicated over and over again. A couple of questions in the chat. So along the same lines of like, does size of unit make a difference? Um, somebody asked if there's any research or if you found any difference around PSC related to years of experience in clinical practice. Yes, so uh, some of the PSC research in nursing shows that uh, people who were sort of greater than 20 years of clinical practice generally had stronger PSCs than people in their earlier years of practice. So I think there is something to uh, experience levels that maybe contributes towards things like self-esteem or self-efficacy, right? Um, you know, the more experienced you are, you probably navigate your role with a little bit more confidence and a little bit more, yeah, efficacy as you're working. But it wasn't the the only factor that impacted it. And they talked about how um, in one of uh, the two studies, particularly around COVID, how COVID actually had impacted a lot of senior nurses as well who had left the profession. And so even just having 20, 30, 40 years of experience actually wasn't enough to prevent burnout in a certain population. And some of that was related to um, how they kind of felt that their role had been devalued during the pandemic. Um, you know, just like keep going to work despite the fact that this horrible thing is happening. Um, and it was more related to a devaluing of their role. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, another really great question in the chat. Uh, from Jen Goldberg about uh, whether or not you've thought about doing any secondary analysis for any of these studies that really dives into the issue of power and potentially taking like a different uh, lens, something intersectional or feminist or anti-oppressive lenses and uh, unpacking that concept a bit further. Yeah, 
I think that's such a great question. And actually, so much of the literature on psychological safety is actually based in um, concepts of power and who has it, who holds it. And really, uh, Edmondson's sort of really early kind of arguments on psychological safety basically argue that you can't have it if you have power differentials. Like you really just can't um, because it's it all comes down to power and how we feel safe in those environments. So uh, yes, I think that actually taking that sort of intersectional feminist lens to this work um, is, is very critical. And the interesting piece that Rachel brings to it is that her background is all in feminist theory and sociology. And so she sort of was the one who always brought that lens of, of kind of power to the conversation. And I think um, having midwifery as part of it, uh, as part of these studies also meant that we could kind of explore that in a little bit more detail. Um, Jika's framework around self-efficacy, um, I actually chose that sort of his, his framework around self-concept because he embedded um, notions of power into his framework where he, um, you know, mentioned that in studies, women and, and men both perceive um, women as holding less self-efficacy uh, just in general than, than men. And so he sort of built that into his framework around how that's, that's um, analyzed. So, yeah, I think... A secondary analysis, especially of the speaking up um, literature, would be really, really fascinating if we took that lens. The only piece uh, that was challenging, um, and I'd love to hear some someone else who has addressed this, was actually outright asking people to identify themselves um, as either, you know, in terms of their gender or their um, ethnicity or things like that. Um, when we were trying to maintain anonymity with a single site study and in a place where um, you know, if you identify yourself as sort of the, the male, the black male resident, like basically everyone will know who you are. And so there was this really challenging dynamic with it being a single site study, but I think, um, it would be really important to look at in a multi, multi-site study and therefore having a bit more anonymity. Yeah, I think you're right. So it's it's obviously a, a program of research we've now mapped out for you. You need to dive into it across the province, across the country. Uh, and it's the you really also, I think, highlighted a lot of unique methods today, too. And so like the simulation piece and how that can, you know, I think have participants actually reflecting on their own piece um, is really important, too. So lots that we could keep chatting about. We are just about out of time, though. So I will pause us there. There is a question in the chat. So if you have a moment, Lauren, to just respond to that, that would be great. Um, also, people will notice that we've got a poll up. So if you can give us some feedback on the presentation today and how you heard about us, that's always helpful for us. And uh, thanks again, Lauren, for joining us and sharing uh, this really exciting research with us. We're just going to put up the poster now as well for our uh, ongoing speaker series uh, for the rest of uh, the kind of academic year, it will take us until June. So you can see we've got a uh, February, March, April, and then June presentations planned. Nothing in May because we will be having our annual symposium during the second week of May. So we'd rather that you join us for that. Uh, and we'll be sending out more information uh, shortly about that as well with the save the date and registration link and everything. But here are some uh, titles for upcoming talks. You can see that the next one will be February 28th, again, noon till one. And our speaker will be Deepa Upadahe, who will be speaking about the Alarm International Program in Ghana, Africa. So we hope that you join us for that. Uh, and if you ever want to watch recordings from previous rounds, if you miss them or want to share them with colleagues, uh, go and check us out on uh, our website, which is www.mmrc.mcmaster.ca. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and thanks for joining us.